acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just doing a sound check. How many of you can hear me okay? How many don't care one way or another? <laughs> Your name, sir?
it's my mom's number three. You understand what I'm saying? When I get to number 10, you're really dealing with what mom would call number three. Here's number one. You are not attending church with a high level of expectancy. If that sounds like you, go check it. Number two, you no longer seem to be concerned about the spiritual condition of your neighbors, family members, or your co-workers. Number three, you haven't had a spiritual conversation with a non-believer in a long time. Number four, the Bible seems like a history book. It's lifeless to you. Number five, your happiness on Sunday mornings is more important than what it takes to reach the unchurched. As long as you get into your parking spot, your seat, and hear music you like, everything's just fine. I see a few of you chucking, but you're not marking them. Number six, the plight of the poor doesn't concern you. Number seven, pictures of overseas suffering do not move you to action. Number eight, you do not give your financial resources sacrificially. Number nine, your prayers don't seem to be making it past the ceiling. Here we are. Number 10. That's where I'm going to be with you this morning. It doesn't even dawn on you that God could do something incredibly radical in your life at any moment today. It's not even on your radar. I'll repeat. It doesn't dawn on you that God could do something incredibly radical in your life at any moment today, it's not even on your radar. In the Gospel of John, we were reminded over and over again as we look at the years that Jesus was on this earth. He lived in the moment. He lived in the moment. He said he was trusting his Heavenly Father for the future. The apostles tried to pin him down on what's it all going to happen. And Jesus said, only my Father knows. But he lived in the moment. And as you remember all the stories in the recording of Jesus' life, when people were hungry, he fed them. When they were blind, healed. When they had a physical malady or disease, he was compassionate enough to deal with the need of the moment. And here in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, it was the Sabbath when no work should be done according to rabbinic law. It was a day of rest. Jesus is coming by the pool called Bethsaida. And he noticed a man who had been blind, laid paralyzed, but one specifically there was an invalid for 38 years. Now the belief about the pool of Bethsaida was that there are certain times during the day that waters would be stirred down below. And I've been to the place in Jerusalem. And the first one that got there would be miraculously healed. You, you probably remember the story. And Jesus realized that this man had been brought by his relatives every day to sit at the pool. And hopefully someone would help him get down into that pool first so that he could be healed. Regular attendance. 38 years. And Jesus knew this. And he had compassion on this man. And he said, Sir, do you want to get well? Well, duh. I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. What a predicament. Then Jesus said to him, Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And the record says the day on which this took place was a 
the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. <laughs> but he said, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And now I jump to verse 16. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. And Jesus said to them, and in my Bible, the next verse is underlined. My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. I too am working. What's number 10? You have no expectation that God is going to do something radical in your life or in the life of this church today, maybe even now. Well, we have historically affirmed that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And He's omnipresent, which means He is always with us. Now those are three amazing statements about our belief in the Almighty God of Jehovah. He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, and He is all with us. And so my statement this morning is, guess who never sleeps? Guess who never sleeps? Now is it difficult for us this morning to believe that God is up to something in our lives right now? Is that a concept hard for you to grasp when you gather here for worship and praise that God might want to do something special in your heart. And I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know your, your condition. I don't know what's going on in your life. And some of you may be struggling with some significant issues. Is it difficult for you to believe that God may want to touch your heart today about those concerns you have? Is that, is that hard to imagine? But really God is with us and by His Spirit He's here right now. And he wants to work in your life and in your heart. And he's present in this church, in this room. Is it possible you can believe he wants to do something unique and special in the life of your fellowship? Perhaps we're too distracted with the mundane to miss the supernatural. Now, I have recently come across a book called For a New Generation, A Practical Guide for Revitalizing Your Church by Lee Pritchard. And this is what he says in this particular chapter called Missing the Whale. He says, when I was in my mid-40s, I went on a three-day scuba diving trip to the Great Barrier Reef off Northwest Australia. On one of my favorite dives, I was about 80 feet deep and the amount and variety of fish and coral were stunning. I spent most of my dive observing a few inches away from me a family of clownfish swimming in and around a large coral area. And when I came up to the surface and got back on deck, I wasn't surprised that the other divers were excited about the dive, but I was surprised at how excited they were about the dive. When I asked them why they were so enthusiastic, one diver said, well, didn't you see the whale? He says, apparently a dwarf whale swam right above us, and I was the only one who didn't see it. I was so focused on the family of clown fish that I missed the whale. And then he said, we often focus on many good things, but by doing so, we miss the extraordinary. I'll give you one other illustration. One researcher named Kevin Ashton has described how our brain blinds our mind to the unusual. For instance, researchers put a clown on a unicycle, fully dressed clown on a unicycle. 
and put the clown in the path of downtown pedestrians. Okay? The researchers asked people who walked past the clown if they had noticed anything unusual. Everybody saw him unless they had been on their cell phone. Three out of four people who had been using their cell phones did not see the clown. They looked back in astonishment when we were told about the clown, unable to believe that they had missed him. They had looked straight at him but had not registered his presence. The unicycle clown crossed their paths but not their minds. And then he says, People can be so focused on lesser things that they can miss what God wants to say and do with them in the moment. Remember, God is always working. So I guess I'm asking what's our intent to gather for worship and praise today? Is it, is it just to sing songs of praise, to listen to a message, to give her our offering and then be dismissed for coffee and fellowship, and that routine can be repeated again and again, week after week. But do we ever get our lives touched in a unique way every time we gather? Now it happens to be one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And if you want to follow along with me, it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and I believe you'll find it on page 402 in your pre Bible. How many brought a Bible with them this morning? So you're just going to hear the word from me. Okay. I believe that the day that everyone brings a Bible is the day I'm ready to get raptured. And one of my goals in the ministry is to get people used to bringing the word with them, whatever translation is coming with you. Okay? So I'm going to read from uh, the 20th chapter in 2 Chronicles. And the backdrop of this story refers to the time that the Israelites were led into the Promised Land under Joshua. They were told to drive out all the inhabitants in the land. And they didn't do it. Once they got their piece of the property, once the, Israel was divided amongst the 12 tribes, they left pockets of resistance, pagan worship, and didn't uh, immediately uh, eradicate them. And here in the 20th chapter of 2 Chronicles, it says the following. Now after this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Menuhites, came to make war on Jehoshaphat. And some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Eden, from the other side of the sea. It is, all, it is already in Hazan Tamar. Alarmed, Joseph resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord and in front of the new courtyard and said, O Lord, our God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to forever to your descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. 
Now, essentially what Jehovah is saying is that we're surrounded, we're afraid, we're paralyzed, and we're desperate. And so he pleads to the Lord with the people gathered around him. Now, there are typical responses to people in distress. Maybe you'll pick yours out of this list. Uh, and, and Jehoshaphat was getting advice in both ears. In times of distress, there are people who just do nothing. Kesarah, Sarah, whatever it will be, we'll just let it happen. There are people who would say, let's get a committee together. There are people who say, let's hire an expert in these things. There are people saying, let's run. Let's flee. There are others who would say, let's hide and just sink into our depression. And so others might say, let's surrender. It's no use. Now, what's your default? Move. What does Jehoshaphat do? Oh, Lord our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face the vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. John Wooden should be a familiar name to you people in the Midwest. He eventually became the head coach at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And in his tenure there, his teams won nine national championships. Uh, no other school has come close to that record and may not ever do that. But John Wooden had a, a favorite phrase he would share with his players every year. And, and I'm not exactly sure how he uh, applied it to basketball because John saw himself as a life coach. This is what John would is being credited for saying. Remember, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, the question now is, what's the main thing in your life? What's the main thing in your life? Better yet, what is God trying to do right now in your heart? In your family? In your church? Maybe even in this very moment. Henry Blackaby, writing in the study guide, Experiencing God, as one of the key tenets of that study, and he says, our job is to figure out what God is doing and then join him. Our job, or the main thing, is to figure out what God is doing right now and then have the courage to join him. Pretty good advice. Lord, here we are at First Baptist Church. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Let's pray.